Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here to give you another video to help you improve your chess game. A few years ago, probably not a few years ago, but a year and a half ago, I did a video called The Most Common Amateur Mistakes, and I think I primarily talked about mistakes that occurred on the board as opposed to maybe mental mistakes. But in any case, I thought I'd revisit that idea, and I, off the top of my head without even looking at that video, I made a list of 10 of the most common mistakes I see for players, let's say, under 16, 1700. Um, and it's, it's, it's all types of mistakes. And you do see some very common mistakes that, that happen across the board. Now, do everybody who has the same rating make the same mistakes? Of course not. You could have two players with the same rating and one plays way too fast and the other plays way too slow. They're both really bad mistakes, but they're completely different. And what you have to do about them, obviously, is completely different. Okay, so let's take a look at my list. All right, the first thing on my list is that when I first started out, nobody told me that I had to look up openings. I just couldn't bear the thought that after I played a game, if there was a place I could look that would tell me what I should have done, why wouldn't I do that? Why would I want to keep making the same mistake over and over and over again? So for instance, uh, a few years ago, I had a student who of course shall remain nameless and he showed me his games. He said he had a lot of books. Let me go to chess.com here. Chess.com, are you active? He's not active. All right, hold on a second. All right, so he told me he had a couple hundred chess books, and he showed me a game, and the game started out something like d4, knight f6, c4, d5. Now, we've talked about this in several of the videos. This is the martial defense, and it's not really much of a defense. If we give this to Stockfish, it's going to say that White's already ahead by about a pawn. And I said to my student, I said, um, you play this for black? He says, yeah, I've been playing this for 20 years. And I said, well, you said you have all those chess books. Have you ever looked up this opening in a chess book? And he said, well, no. And I said, well, you won't, you're going to have trouble finding it because it's a very rare defense because it's not very good if you... If you look in modern chess openings, it's going to have a little footnote saying, don't do this. And again, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here on why, but basically after pawn takes pawn, knight takes, white plays knight f3 followed by e4, and gets a big, big, big advantage with this AWL kind of thing of attacking the knight. So my student was not in the, pro in the habit of looking up his games after his games, and he'd been playing a bad move order for 20 years. Um, and I find a lot of my students are like that. They, you know, these days you have a lot more than MCO. You've got a lot of books. You've got books on specific openings. You've got the database that I have here in front of me from chess.com. You've got videos on openings. And you've got engines that you can turn on that have either the database built in or that if they don't, they can figure it out pretty quickly. So after each game, you want to look up your opening and see if you can find at least one place where if, if the same person if, the, if your opponent played the same kind of moves again, you could play a better move next time. You always want to get at least one more new move, especially if they're playing some sort of main line. If they open up the game A4, then you don't have to look up the book for A4. But if they're in something like this, you should be able to look it up and say, oh, I'm not supposed to play the sequence for black. Next time I'm going to play a Queen's Gambit or a Nimzo Indian or something like that. So not looking up your openings after the game is a very, very common mistake. Another common mistake they play, and let's go over to ICC here. Let's pause chess.com. The common mistake is they'll study a move sequence like A, B, C, D, E, and their opponent will play A, they'll play B, and the opponent won't play C, and they'll play D anyway. Well, D might be a Kennedy move, but it's very often not the right idea. For instance, a student the other day was <clears throat> looking at E4, C5, knight f3 e6 and now he knew that if they played d4 he plays c takes d knight takes d knight c6 and queen c7 <clears throat> but instead they played bishop e2 he played knight c6 they played c3 and he played queen c7 anyway well queen c7 doesn't make any sense in this position white hasn't played the open sicilian and the queen doesn't necessarily belong on c7 anymore it's not a terrible move but it's not a very good one either. Black should be trying in this kind of opening to play an early d5, which is something he wouldn't play in, a, in the open Sicilian when he's playing this line. If white had played 
d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4. Playing a really early d5 is not a great idea usually in this kind of position, but in the way white was playing it with the c3 and bishop e2 without d4, then d5 was the best idea. But he just said, well, I normally play a Tamanov, so I'll just play Tamanov moves. But he wasn't in a Tamanov, and I see this kind of problem all the time. Another student I had who was playing a French defense wasn't looking it up, and White played the classical. He played knight f6, and I said, have you looked this up as to what the main lines are here for White? And he said, no, I haven't. And I said... Well, if you look in a database, if we go back to chess.com like we had before, you'll see that there's really only two moves that you have to study here. One is bishop to g5, when you could play the classical bishop e7. You could play the McCutcheon bishop b4, which I think is kind of fun. Or you could even play pawn takes pawn. Or if they play the Steinitz kind of line e5, you play knight d7, and then you break with c5. He says, well, what about if they save the pawn by taking with the pawn? And I say, well, you're going to take with the pawn then if they do that and get into an exchange French. But you don't have to worry about that too much. It's almost never played. And then I went to the database and I showed him that, that e5 and bishop g5 were both played thousands and thousands of times. And e takes d5 was hardly played at all. It was a tremendous drop-off. So if you learn how to use the database, when you see that tremendous drop-off, it tells you, Oh, I don't need to study that line yet. It's not a very popular line. If somebody plays it, it's not all that wonderful for him, and I can probably wing it a little bit, but I need to play the lines that, that occur thousands and thousands of times, not the lines that occur a few dozen times. Okay, a third type of error is students don't pay attention to the safety table. If you don't know what the safety table is, you might want to go back and look at my video on the safety table. The safety table is a list of all the squares on the board where something is attacked and whether it's guarded or not. So for instance, one of my students played a game the other day, e4, c5, knight f3, e6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c6, knight c3. He played Tamanov, queen c7. Actually, he didn't play, did he play queen c7? No, no, I don't think he did. I think he played knight f6. And now white quickly played bishop d3. Well, putting a bishop on d3 is a, is, a, is a move in some Sicilians, but here it's just a silly move because it blocks the queen guarding the knight. Well, if you had done the safety table before bishop d3, the safety table is all the squares on the board that are attacked by one side and, and whether it's guarded or not. So, if, uh, sorry, all the squares that are attacked that are occupied. So for here, let's look at all the squares for black that are attacked by white. The knight takes e6 is attacked by white. It's attacked by a knight. It's guarded by two pawns. If white takes the pawn, black takes back with either pawn and he wins a knight. Knight takes c6 is on the safety table. The c6 square, it's guarded by two different pawns. If white takes there, black takes back and it's safe. The e4 square is on the safety table. It's attacked by a black knight. It's guarded by a knight. If what black takes there, and white takes back, black would win, sorry, white would win a knight for a pawn. The d4 square is on the safety table. If uh, it would black's move and black would play knight d4, white would play queen takes d4, and it would be safe also. As soon as you play, white plays bishop d3, a big alarm should go off, and you should say, oh, wait a second. The only reason that knight was safe on d4 was the queen was guarding it, and now he's removed his own guard, and now you can play knight takes d4. So black would play knight takes d4 and win. Instead, black was on automatic, and he, even though it was a sl slow game and he had plenty of time, he said, okay, he developed his bishop. I should develop my pieces too. So black played like bishop to e7 instead of taking the knight, and now white still didn't realize he had the knight on prees and white castles. They're still ignoring the safety table. Once you miss it once, of course, it doesn't go away, but people have a tendency, weaker players have a tendency to feel... feel well, if the current move doesn't is safe, then everything is safe, which of course is not true. You could have leftover issues from previous moves. And now black also castled. So both sides have spent the last few moves missing the fact that black could win a piece with knight takes d4, which white is continually not solving and black is continually not taking advantage of. So they're not really paying attention to the safety table. All right, number four on my list was only looking at the piece that moved. And we just talked about that. So for instance here, 
if Black looks at White's move castles and says, is that safe? He would go, well, I can't attack the king. There's no way to mate him. The rook over here on f1 is not attacked. Okay, well, then that move must be safe. And that's the mistake of only looking at the pieces that move and not all the affected squares. Well, here, d4 is not affected, but it is affected in the kind of default way of saying that it's still no longer guarded. So it is affected by allowing that knight to still be unguarded. So things can be affected both directly and indirectly by a move. Knight, the fact that black can play knight takes d4 is indirectly affected by castles because white is allowing black to continue to do that. So that's a very, very important effect, even though it's an indirect effect. And he's not doing that. And so one of the things you have to watch out for in chess is you have to look at all the squares on the board to see if there's safety issues. There's many, many squares that can be affected. If you go to my website, danheisman.com, and go to my articles and blogs, and go to my chess.com articles and blogs, I have a, I think it's a blog I wrote a few years ago called All the Ways the Square is Affected, uh, sorry, All the Ways the Board is Affected by a Move, and we came up with more than a dozen different ways that a board can be affected. So you can't just look at the piece that moved or the square it's moving to. You have to look at all the interferences, all the discoveries, all the things it's no longer guarding, all the things it no longer can do, all the things it can now do. There's a whole bunch of ideas, but any one of those could be the thing that decides the game. So you have to look at all the issues on, on the piece that moves. The next common thing that I see is hand waving. And I've, I've given the same example on that quite a few times. Let's clear out the board. I think the example was something like this, where uh, white has just played bishop, sorry, black has played bishop takes f6, and white has pawns here and here, black king here, black pawn here. And I like this example, it's a good hand waving example. If you hand wave here and it's white's move and he wants to take the bishop, you could say, well, king takes f6 looks pretty good. It doesn't double my pawns. It attacks the pawn on f7. If I can win that pawn on f7, I'm going to be able to take my e pawn in and get a queen. Therefore, king takes f6 is probably the right move. Well, all right, if you're playing a speed game and you only have one minute for the whole game, maybe you'll do something like that. But that's hand-waving. The analysis would be to analyze all the possibilities. In this case, the two main possibilities are king takes f6 and e takes f6 to figure out which ones actually win or draw or at least which ones, if you can't go that far, which you should be able to, at least figure out which ones are better, and not hand wave and make an analytical move on general principles. Making an analytical move on general principles, I call hand waving. It's okay to hand wave, like for instance, at the start of a game, if your opponent plays A4 and we flip the board and you're black, and you wanna hand wave here and say, gee, I'd like to grab the center with D5 or E5, that's okay, there's no analysis here, you can't, Say, well, if I do that and he does that and I do this and he does that, what's going to happen? Well, you know, all those moves are going to be safe. You're just moving on general principles here. And it's okay to hand wave a position like this, but you can't hand wave the previous position. The sixth, things I have, the sixth thing I have on my list is hope chess. Hope chess could be defined as anything you might hope for in chess, like you make a threat and you hope your opponent doesn't meet it or uh, you make a bad move and hope your opponent doesn't take advantage of it. But that's, I didn't mean any of those things when I originally wrote about hope chess. And I have a couple videos just on hope chess. Hope chess to me is you make a move without looking to see if your opponent has a check, capture, or threat that can beat you on the next move. And if he does and he makes one, then you hope you can meet it. So I give a whole bunch of hope chess examples, but let's see if I can remember one here. Let's flip the board back. Game flip. Uh, there was a game d4, d5. I think it was something like knight f3, bishop f5, c4, knight c6, c takes d5. Okay, well, it's black's turn, and the pawn is attacking the knight, and what is just captured a pawn? What should black do? He should capture black back. Instead, Black very, very quickly, he, this was like a very slow game, but he played the next move in like 10 seconds. He played knight to b4 very quickly with the idea of, wow, I'm attacking that pawn again, but even more, I'm threatening the fork. Maybe he won't see that, and I'll win the rook. Well, if you say to me that's hope chess because you're hoping he won't see the fork or you're hoping he won't stop it, that's not really what I meant by hope chess. What I meant by hope chess was you make a move without looking at his checks, captures, or threats to see if he can meet them. Well, if we look at White's checks, captures, and threats, and we start with the checks, how many checks does White have? 
Well, he only has one check, and, and I asked Black, did he look for White's checks, captures, and threats? And he said, of course not. I was just interested in trying to get the fork. Well, White has one check. It's queen a4 check. What does it do? It double attacks the king and the knight. And if, the, if Black gets out of check by blocking with the bishop or the queen, we just take off the knight, and we win a knight. If he tries to put the knight back in the way, we just take it off with the pawn and we win the knight. And if he blocks it with the pawn, uh, I could take the pawn and then take the knight, or I could just take the knight right away. But you get the idea. Queen a4 check is winning the knight. Well, it's not the hope that black played where he's hoping to get in knight c2 that I meant, although that, that's certainly a form of hope. If you wanted to find hope chess as anything you hope for in chess, then that is hope chess. But that's not what I meant. I meant here... Black made no attempt to see whether his move was safe, and he completely missed queen a4 check, which is what white did, and white won the knight and won the game. So that is hope chess. All right, uh, the next common mistake I see is people don't know how to analyze. Maybe they've played their whole life without analysis. Even if they've taken their time, they just hand wave and hand wave and hand wave and hand wave, or they just kind of generalize to themselves in a form of hand waving, but they really don't know how to analyze. They don't know how to say, if I make this move, what are all the moves my opponent can make? Like, for instance, let's do a Roy Lopez. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, a6, bishop takes, pawn takes, knight takes. Well, if I ask people, what should black play here? They kind of get the idea that black has a bunch of double attacks. They, they know that queen d4 attacks the knight and the pawn. They know queen e7 skewers the knight and the pawn. They know queen g5 attacks the knight on e5 and the pawn on g2. But when I ask them which one's better, and they have to, like, analyze it, well, that's a much harder job. They, they're not used to that. They're, they're used to just kind of picking one on, you know, sight and saying, well, gee, I really like that queen g5 hitting the pawn and the knight, or gee, I really like that queen e7 skewering the knight and the pawn, or really, I really like that queen d4 hitting the knight and the pawn, but they don't know how to analyze further. Like, for instance, they don't know how to analyze... Queen d4 hitting the knight in the pawn. White could, for instance, save the knight with knight f3. Then black's certainly going to take the pawn, get his pawn back. Now white only has two medieval moves, king f1 or queen e2. If you're analyzing, you're going to analyze queen e2, because if you play king f1, you can't castle, and the queens are on the board. If you're not going to be able to castle, it's much better to have the queens off the board. So the analysis, if you're analyzed looking ahead, you'd look at queen e2, and then you'd say, well, black... His queen is pinned to the king. He may as well stop white from castling. At this point, the position is quiescent, which means you can stop analyzing. If you look ahead from the time that white took the pawn here, you could say knight takes e5, queen d4, knight f3, queen takes e4, check, queen e2, queen takes e2, king takes e2. And if you could visualize that, visualization being one of those things that weak players have trouble with, they have trouble visualizing things, they need to work on their visualization so they can analyze because you can't analyze very well if you can't visualize. And then you have, at the end of that, you have to evaluate. Well, let's evaluate the position. Knight f3, queen e4, queen e2, queen takes, king takes. Who's better? Well, when I ask people who's better here, when I ask them to evaluate, they often say, well, black is better because white can't castle. Well, they're one out of two there. Black is doing at least equal here, if not better, but it has nothing to do with white castling because there's no way that black can stop white from castling by hand with a move like rook e1 followed by king f1. There's no way to stop him from doing that. Then they might say, well, white's, if, if it's not for white not castling, then, then white might be better because he has the better pawn structure. Well, white does have the better pawn structure, but his four on four on the queen side where black has the double pawns cannot create a passed pawn, so it's not a big deal advantage in the pawn structure. The real big deal in this position, learning how to analyze, and this is one of the things that weaknesses people have, is they, they don't evaluate very well, and they, they're not aware of the, the value of things other than the average value of the pieces, is that black has the bishop pair. The bishop pair doesn't mean you have two bishops, which is another mistake people make. They, they hear things like the bishop pair, and they assume, rightly so, that in English that means you have two bishops, so therefore Black has the bishop pair here. Well, but the bishop pair doesn't mean you have two bishops. If that were true, both sides would have the bishop pair at the start of the game. The bishop pair is really short for the advantage of the bishop pair 
which means you've got it and they don't, which means black has two bishops and white doesn't. And that on the average is worth a half a pawn. And in this position, half a pawn is a big, big thing. So if we turn on Stockfish and we say, Mr. Stockfish, how much of an advantage does he have? Oops, hold on, let me... Okay, just had to bring up the engine. All right, Mr. Stockfish, how do you evaluate this position? Look at that. Black is ahead by about 0.8. Now let's let's give back the bishop here just to show you what would happen. Let's say black plays bishop g4 and white plays rook e1 and black plays bishop takes f3 check and white plays king f3. Well, you, if you're a beginner, you might think, well, black's advantage has grown because that poor white king is out toward the middle of the board and all black has to do is get out of check and, the, and that white king's going to be in trouble for the rest of the game. But look at the evaluation. The evaluation has dropped from minus 0.9 to almost equal. Black has a microscopic advantage here. Now it's back to zero, zero, zero. Why? Because black doesn't have the bishop here anymore. So therefore, he really has no advantage in this position. This is one of the ways you can use these modern computers to play if games with yourself. You know, bishop to g4 was not the best move. And in this position, certainly playing bishop takes f3 check. Stockfish says, ironically, the best move is to move your king to play king to d7. Notice knight e5 check, forking the king and the bishop is illegal because the, the knight's pinned, but don't give him the bishop pair. Don't give up the bishop pair so that neither side would have it and you, you lost your advantage. So again, we're using the engine to, to learn things and that's what you want to do after the game. A lot of people go on chess.com or Lee Chess and after the game, the engine analyzes their game and gives them a little printout, and they think that's a be-all and end-all of analyzing their game with the engine. Well, that gives the highlights of the analysis, and, and it certainly points out any big blunders you made, but it's not nearly as helpful as doing what we're doing here, where we're going move by move, and we're asking the computer questions like, gee, if he gives up that bishop for the knight, is that bad for white because the king has to come all the way out, or is that bad for black because he no longer has the advantage of the bishop pair? So all these kind of things, again, we see lower-rated players don't do. They they don't go over their game move by move and force the engine. You see, I can tell the engine, you know, show me the top five moves in this position. And Stockfish says the top five moves for black are queen e2 check, bishop f5 guarding the queen, queen e6 guarding the queen, queen e7 guarding the queen, and knight f6 guarding the queen. You know, I'm always asking the computer these questions, and that's how young players get to be grandmasters so quickly these days. You know, at age 12, 13, 14, where it used to take people to age 16, 17, 18, because they've got all these wonderful tools that you can use, and you can use them too. All right, what else do we have on my list? Playing too slow or too fast. We already mentioned that. That's a very common problem. You could also not only play too fast or too slow for the whole game. In other words, if it's a 45-45 game, you could finish the game with 70 minutes on your clock playing too fast. Or you could run your clock down to two minutes after you've played, you know, 15 moves, and then you have to play the whole rest of the game in the two minutes left, even though you have an increment playing way, 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 way too slow. Either of those are really terrible. Or you could play too fast or too slow on individual moves. For instance, you, you could have a position like in the coal system where you don't know where to put your bishop, and you take six minutes to figure out if you should play bishop d3 or bishop e2. That's playing way, way, way too slow for the circumstance because this is not a critical move. Or you could have a complicated move later in the game and have lots of time on your clock. And even though you've taken a reasonable amount of time up to that point, you could throw up your hands and say, oh, I can't figure this out. Let me just guess what I should do and make a move in 10 seconds, which is not necessarily playing too fast for the whole game, but it's playing way too fast for a critical move. Okay, another mistake I commonly see people do is they, they make... They play the, with the same principles whether no matter what the state of the game is. So they'll play with the same principle in the opening versus the end game or the middle game versus the end game. They'll play with the same principle whether it's a closed position or an open position. They'll play with the same principle whether they're castled on opposite sides or not. So when you have all these different states, some of the principles make a lot more sense than, than they do in other cases. And they'll misapply principles. For instance, you know, I'll ask people, what should you do when you're winning? And they'll say, you should trade. Well, the right way to really learn that is you should make fair trades of pieces, not necessarily pawns. If you just trade, 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 let's say you're up, you have a bishop and a knight versus just a knight, and you have two pawns versus two pawns, 
and you trade off your two pawns against his two pawns because you learned that you should trade when you're winning, well, now you have a bishop and a knight versus a knight, but no pawns, and you can't use your extra piece to win his pawns because you traded them off, and you can't, you can't win a position like that. You're up a piece, but there's no pawns to queen. So the, 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 the uh, principle is not when you're winning trade, it's make fair trades of pieces, not necessarily pawns. Sometimes you want to trade pawns when you're winning, sometimes you don't. There's no principle that says don't trade pawns or do trade pawns. It really depends on the position. If you're not sure, I think I have an earlier video called Trading Pawns When Ahead or Behind, if you want to watch that video. But you can't just apply the principle trade when you're ahead, because A, that's not a very good principle. It, the principle I just mentioned is better. And B, it might lead you to throw away the win if you're just trading willy-nilly, like trading off those last pawns. Okay, the last thing my students do is they have a better idea. For instance, they learn a principle like, you know, in the opening, move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. So they learn the principle, and of course, you know, I can read it to them from Lasker's book, Common Sense in Chess, which is about his 1895 lecture. And they'll get to a position like this, and they know they should bring out their bishop, they know they should castle, they know they should get the other knight out, they know they should do those things, but instead they say, wow, this knight would be better on e5 than it is on f3, and they play knight to e5. Well, I call that having a better idea. You know, is the knight better on e5 than f3? Well, maybe, maybe not, but if you think it is, it certainly shouldn't go there now. You should follow the principle first, but they can't help themselves. They have a better idea. Well, if knight e5 is checkmate, well, that's different. Then you don't care about any principles. As I said in my recent video, if you know exactly what you should do, your analysis tells you what the best move is. You don't need to follow principles. But if you should follow principles because you don't know what to do and there is no clearly best move, then deciding you're going to on purpose break principles, I call that having a better idea. So here, let's, let's have Stockfish list the top five moves. Let's see where knight e5 is. Watch, Stockfish will make me a make me a uh, liar. No, Stockfish doesn't. Stockfish says the top five moves are c4, which makes it kind of a queen's gambit declined. Uh, b3, which is kind of a Steinitz, uh, sorry, a Zuckertort Col, Col system. Uh, knight bd2, which is a regular Col kind of move. Uh, bishop d3, which is a main Col move. And that other move I talked about, about people taking a long time, which is bishop e2, which is not quite as good as bishop d3, but at least it moves every piece once, and it gets you ready to castle, so it makes sense. So knight e5 is not one of the top five moves here. And if you get tempted to play knight e5 before you finish developing your pieces in a position like this, then you're having a better idea. And having a better idea, which means you know what you should be doing, but you decide not to do it anyway, even though... All your instructors, all the best people, all the best teachers, all the best players in the history of the planet have always told you, try to do these things to learn how to be a better player, but you're going to have a better idea instead. That's not a good thing, having a better idea. It really means you know what you should be doing and you purposely don't do it. I also read a novice book called Accidental versus Purposeful Errors. Accidental errors are where, is where you do the best that you can, you analyze the best you can, and you're human and you make a mistake and somebody takes advantage of it and you lose. Okay, join the club. But purposeful errors is where you know what you should be doing, like getting all your pieces out, and instead you decide to do something else instead, which is not so good. That's a purposeful error. You, you purposely didn't get all your pieces out. You decided you were going to do something else. Purposeful errors from an instructor's standpoint are much worse than accidental errors. Everybody makes accidental errors, but you really don't want to make purposeful errors. Okay, so that's my video today on common mistakes made by amateurs under 1600 and of course some people even over 1600 make these same mistakes try not to do these things and you'll get to be a better player it takes a while getting better at chess is not easy if you can please tell other friends of yours other chess friends about my channel here dan heisman chess i think i got over 220 videos now to help everybody in it. and i've got all different types of videos covering almost every issue you need to get better at chess so you could probably watch the videos on my website and you wouldn't be missing a lot in terms of improvement ideas. Tell your friends. Of course, if you want to like the video, you can and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate it. All right. For Dan, my website, my YouTube channel. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.